offering to the cloud. And uh, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the College of Charleston's uh, Moroz World Affairs Colloquium Series. My name is Max Kovalov. I, I, I'm the Bennett Director of the Moroz Global Leadership Institute. The John Edwin Moroz Global Leadership Institute is a collaborative partnership between the School of Languages, Cultures, and World Affairs and the East West Institute. John Edwin Moroz was the founder and president of the East West Institute, and he was a champion of conflict prevention and resolution. And then he served as a primary liaison in the Middle East during the fall of the Berlin Wall in the US Soviet relations. And the mission of the John Moroz Institute is to promote essential skills of global fluency and diplomacy and to continue this legacy of the East West Institute and its founder, John Edwin Moroz. And we work to prepare students to become future global leaders through experiential learning opportunities, international mentoring programs, study abroad experiences and professional development programs. I encourage you to visit the Moroz Institute website at morozinstitute.cofc.edu to learn more about us, about our programs. And this colloquium series is an important part of the Moroz Institute programming designed to bring to campus prominent speakers with international experience to stimulate discussions uh, with our students, faculty, and the Charleston community. And I thank you for joining us tonight, uh, whether this is your returning visit or the first time uh, here. We're grateful that you're here, you're with, with us. If you have a question for our speaker, you can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, or you can just raise your hands. There's a button to raise your hand and you can ask a question. And, and I think Ambassador Melville will have uh, an interactive experience with uh, Dr. Donfried and um, um, uh, he will lead the discussion. Uh, I will now turn the program over to Ambassador Melville to introduce tonight's guest. Thank you, Max. Um, Dr. Karen Donfried is the president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And the title of uh, Karen's talk this evening is Charting a New Course for Transatlantic Cooperation. Karen and I met when she was the National Intelligence Officer for Europe at the National Intelligence Council. That means I, I was the executive director of the European Bureau at the time, and I was getting ready to go to Berlin as deputy chief of mission. And Karen was the one person in the US government who knew more about Germany than anyone else. And proving that fact, um, her next job, she became um, special assistant to the president and senior director for Europe at the National Security Council, where she, she served with great distinction before becoming president of the German Marshall Fund. Um, in 2018, uh, when I left the State Department under um, less than happy circumstances, I can tell you that I am personally very grateful to Karen for the way that she um, she reached out and welcomed me home in a way that uh, Mike Pompeo did not do, shall we say. And so, Karen, we are so honored um, to have you this evening, and um, I wish it were in person, but I'm going to take uh, my prerogative as host and MC before turning the floor over to you to um, make a request and ask a question. And the request is that you please tell us about the, the, the wonderful and important work that the German Marshall Fund does, its history, and um, just inform our community a little bit about something that, that we don't see very often. And, um, and then tell us about the current state of the transatlantic relationship. So the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to meet Dean Johnson and Professor Kovalov. And it's just a special treat to see Ambassador Melville again. As, as Jim mentioned, we intersected when I was in government and I've been in and out of government, but Jim had such a distinguished career of public service. And I just want to applaud that. And all of you who are studying now and thinking about the career path you want to follow, I think there are a few things that are as rewarding as public service. And I just hope all of you will consider that when you think about the career choices that are there ahead of you. Um, so to Jim's question, of course, I'd love to take the opportunity to tell you about the German Marshall Fund of the United States. I have my branding behind me here. The organization I have the privilege of running has a very complicated name. So you start out thinking that we're a German organization, and then you get to the of the United States, 
and you think, oh, it must be an American organization, but this is very confusing. The name captures the history. In 1972, the then West German government of Willy Brandt wanted to say thank you to us Americans for Marshall Plan assistance. And the idea they settled on was creating an American organization that would be devoted to strengthening transatlantic cooperation in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. So in the spirit of this liberal democratic order that the United States together with its European allies set up at the end of World War II. We had a very broad mandate and I would say there are two unique aspects of the work GMF does today. One is our geographic footprint. So GMF, it's headquartered here in Washington, DC but we have seven offices across Europe. Perhaps not surprisingly, the largest European office is in Berlin. And so my colleagues there interacted a lot with uh, Ambassador Melville when he was in Berlin. We're also in Brussels, in Paris, in Warsaw, in Belgrade, in Bucharest, and in Ankara. So it is very much a Europe-wide presence and half of our staff is European. So that's one distinctive feature of GMF. The second is, the mix of activities. So a third of what we do is sort of a classic think tank, having smart people who are senior fellows on NATO and the European Union and what does a rising China mean for the US and Europe and all kinds of other topics. Um, we do write, we speak, um, and we have conferences. The second part of our programmatic work is supporting civil society particularly in the Balkans and the Black Sea region. And there we actually are re-granting US government money and some European funding as well to try to build a more vibrant civil society in those regions that were formerly communist. And as we know, democracy isn't just about free and fair elections, it's about citizens holding government accountable. And by trying to build that stronger civil society, really that's ultimately what you're trying to do is encourage citizens to take responsibility uh, for their communities and their countries. The third area of work is our leadership programs. So there we have fellowship programs. Our most important is the Marshall Memorial Fellowship. We bring young professional Europeans to the US and young professional Americans to Europe. And I have to say the leadership committee, the selection committees have done very good work because people like Emmanuel Macron are alums of the program. And we have about 4,000 alumni of that program today. So that gives you a sense of the work GMF does. And my background is very much in the policy space. So I worked on the Hill for about 10 years. I came to GMF the first time. I then went and worked in the Bush administration, actually at the State Department on the policy planning staff, uh, came back to GMF and then went into the Obama administration in the roles that Jim had mentioned. And I now have the great privilege of, of running GMF. So I've looked at the transatlantic relationship and, and worked on the transatlantic relationship for my whole career. So when we think about where we are today, uh, at the moment, I think it feels like there's real opportunity in the transatlantic relationship to see the United States and its European allies working closely together to meet the global challenges that we both would identify. And this moment feels special because the last four years have been quite turbulent. And I think everyone's aware that former President Trump had, in a sense, an untraditional view of the alliance with Europe. So I would say since the end of World War II, successive US presidents, regardless of party, have believed that the United States was stronger when it was working together with its European allies on any particular challenge. That doesn't mean we always agreed on everything, but there was an overarching belief that allies were an asset for the United States. Former President Trump had the view that the United States had gotten a bad deal from its European allies and we were being taken advantage of. And the two issues he focused on in particular were defense spending. He was rightly concerned that not all of our European allies were meeting the NATO guideline of spending 2% of their GDP on defense. And the other issue that 
upset him was trade imbalances. And I would say on both of these issues, Germany was the poster child of what he did not like because Germany wasn't spending 2% of its GDP on defense and Germany runs a large trade surplus with the United States. So it was a rocky four years and you'll all remember the different chapters of that relationship over the past four years. So when Joe Biden was elected in November, for the most part, this isn't true everywhere in Europe, but for the most part, there, you could almost hear the sigh of relief coming from European capitals because a more traditional US president was gonna be returning to the Oval Office. And I think it's probably fair to say that the United States will never again have as pro-European a president as Joe Biden. Joe Biden, from his decades in the US Senate, from his eight years as vice president, knows Europe extremely well, has existing relationships with many current European leaders, and has been clear in everything he said in recent months that when he talks about America is back, America is re-engaging on the world stage, he sees revitalized alliances as part of the US footprint in the world. So he's looking to those allies to cooperate with the United States across the whole menu of issues from pandemics and economic recovery to China and Russia to technology and climate. I mean, there are many more issues, but let's name those as the top six. So I think at the moment there's real opportunity in the relationship, but it would be a mistake to think that that cooperation is going to be easy or to forget that we don't necessarily agree on all these issues. And I think that is compounded by the fact that while Europeans at first blush are very excited about a Biden administration, you also hear another sentiment when you talk to Europeans. And that is, and I've this may be true for Ambassador Melville as well, but when I talk to Europeans, what I also often hear is, Karen, the United States may not have reelected Donald Trump, but Trumpism is alive and well in the United States. And they would look at January 6th as one example of that and, and the assault on the US Capitol. So they say, we're not sure what's gonna happen in the United States in 2024. So we Europeans need to hedge. We're not sure we want to go all in with the United States on some of these issues. So I think there remain important challenges to the transatlantic relationship as we move forward in 2021. So Jim, let me stop with that and, and we can take off from there. I think that's a, that, that's a great start, Karen. Thank you. Um, and yeah, the, 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 describing it as a rocky four years is, sounds, sounds pretty accurate. But um, what do you think will be the most important issue going forward for the US and Europe to cooperate? And that cooperation is not just an end in itself. It's, it's, it's kind of the way, I think, for us to begin building back that credibility and predictability in the relationship that, was, that became somewhat uh, attenuated. You know, that last point you made is an interesting one, because when I think about alliance, I think alliance has to rest on a set of shared values. I think allies need to have common interests, but they also need to have trust. And I think one of the things that really was shattered over the past four years was trust. So you've seen President Biden come in and immediately try to reassure allies. And in the case of our European allies, it started with his rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. And there have been many other actions he's taken since uh, he was inaugurated to try to reassure the European allies. So I think that's one thing he moved out on very quickly. Um, you could argue that the most immediate issue we need to cooperate on is the pandemic. Um, I'm not gonna focus on that. We can talk about that in some detail because I wanna to get to the, your question, which is what's the most important issue for us to cooperate on sort of over time. And for that, I think the answer is China. I think that if the United States and Europe don't develop a cooperative strategy on China, 
that both the United States and Europe will be in a weaker position in terms of the global competition that we see with China. And US European cooperation on China, there's not a long track record of this, <laughs> because, no. the United, because the United States and Europe have had fundamentally different relationships with China, right? The United States is a great power. And we have a developed political relationship with China. We have a very important economic relationship with China. We have treaty allies in Asia. Uh, so the United States has this vast and complex relationship with China. I don't mean to be unfair to Europe, but I would argue that European countries have primarily had an economic relationship with China. You know, take a country like Germany that Jim and I know well. They are dependent on China as an export market for their goods. So you've had these different relationships that have led us to engage with China differently. Now, I would say that Europe's relationship with China has changed more over the past three, four years than it had over the preceding decade. Why do I say that? I say that because while Europe really thought of its relationship with China as, you know, it's about Europe going to China and selling things and building an economic relationship. And suddenly Europe started paying attention to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which actually was about China coming west. <laughs> And as China came west, it was buying up strategic infrastructure across Europe. And Europeans, kind of when they realized the extent of this, thought, okay, wait, this is not good. And then you add to that human rights issues, whether it was China's treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang or China's crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong. I mean, you all know the list. So Europe started souring on China at arguably the same time that in the United States, you saw a growing bipartisan consensus that the United States had not been tough enough on China. You know, for a long time, at least since the United States supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization, there was a dominant belief in the US that if China were to liberalize economically, that would have a knock-on effect in terms of China liberalizing politically. And over time, Americans realized this does not seem to be true. <laughs> We've seen China liberalize economically, but there doesn't seem to be any political liberalization happening. It was, it was a leap of faith that was a, a, a hope that was disappointed. Right. So, you know, Americans are kind of waking up to this. And, and also Americans and Europeans appreciate that we share many of the same grievances with China, right? Like China joined the World Trade Organization and took on a set of responsibilities that we have never forced China actually to assume, right? Around foreign direct investment, around stealing intellectual property. These are concerns that Americans and Europeans share. So we then saw Europe, the European Union in a public paper talked about China as a systemic rival. The German Business Association, the BDI, which has large economic interests with China, mm -hmm. had pr preceded that by offering a paper talking about China as a systemic rival. So it seemed that on the Venn diagram, there was more opportunity for the US and Europe to cooperate because we increasingly shared a similar view of China. Um, now, I think it's not that easy because, um, you know, I don't know if anyone noticed what happened in the dark days of last December, but on December 30th, the European Union concluded a comprehensive agreement on investment with China. And this only really caught Americans by surprise because for seven years, the European Union had been negotiating this agreement and basically the Chinese weren't really playing ball. And what do you know, after Joe Biden's election, uh, it seems pretty clear that the Chinese are concerned that Americans and Europeans might now work more closely together with regard to China. And China becomes quite interested in, in concluding this agreement. Germany is 
presiding over the EU, there's a rotating presidency in the European Union. It's very important to Chancellor Merkel to conclude this agreement. And on December 30th, it's agreed. And there was a lonely tweet from Jake Sullivan, who is now the national security advisor. And as you all know, in the United States, when there's a transition in government, there's a belief that there should be one president at a time. So it's not appropriate for anyone who's going into a Biden administration to be talking to foreign counterparts. So there was a tweet from Jake Sullivan saying, we look forward to working with the European Union on China, which everyone saw as a move to try to forestall the Europeans from concluding this agreement, but yeah. it didn't happen. So, you know, I think the administration is saying, all right, where is Europe on China? I mean, are they hedging? Do they want to work with us on this? So I think the conversations between the Biden administration, the European Union, and national governments is going to be a very important one so that we can decide what is the approach we're going to take with China on trade? What is the approach we're going to take on human rights? And on an issue like climate, there are opportunities to cooperate with China, but really pulling apart the strands of that policy. And you've seen the Biden administration named Kurt Campbell as the person who's supposed to sit at the National Security Council and have a whole of government perspective on China, which I think is also gonna be really important because there are so many elements of a policy or that the policies that would make up a strategy toward China. So Jim, I think this is gonna be a critical issue. It's not an easy one, but it's the 21st century issue. Well, related to that, Karen, um, you know, the, 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 the trade relationship between the EU and the United States hasn't been the smoothest either. And I don't mean just during the Trump administration. I mean, I, you know, a lot of us spend a lot of time trying to get TTIP in place. And, and in the end, it went nowhere. And all that work was for nothing. So how important do you think it is that we work on our own trade relationship before, you know, getting completely caught up in what it means for the relationship with China? Well, and I was going to say, Jim, you probably know more about chlorinated chicken than you ever wanted to know. You know, there are all these kind of wacky trade issues in the U.S.-European relationship. But, you know, Jim's point is exactly right. I mean, we, we have had trade disputes with Europe over time. Um, and the Obama administration was interested in trying to conclude two trade agreements, right? One was the Trans-Pacific Partnership mm -hmm. and the other was the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, what Jim was referring to. And the idea there was that if we're concerned about a rules-based trading order and we're concerned about China adhering to a rules-based trading order, we need to work with our allies to extend that trade regime, putting pressure on China to accede to it. Now, the Obama administration failed on both counts. They didn't get either TPP or TTIP done. But on TTIP, it wasn't like there was lots of enthusiasm in Europe for this. And the country Jim served in Germany was one where you saw large demonstrations against TTIP. Now, I would argue these were missed opportunities. I think we have an important debate going on in the United States right now about what kind of trade agreements are benefit, beneficial to the American public. And this whole idea of a Biden administration pursuing a foreign policy for the middle class, part of that I think is looking anew at what kind of trade agreements the United States should be concluding that really benefit the majority of Americans. So I think we're having an internal conversation about trade in this country, but in terms of the relationship with Europe, what's happened already in this administration is President Biden had his first phone call with the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, last week. And they announced that they were suspending tariffs on a specific trade dispute around aircraft subsidies. So the United States had accused the Europeans of put, giving subsidies to Airbus, and the European Union had accused the United States of giving subsidies to Boeing. And basically, the World Trade Organization decided in favor of the United States, and the Trump administration promptly had put um, 
uh, uh, sanctions on the EU, and then they later judged in favor of the EU and the EU reciprocated. So we've got this really nasty dispute. And Biden and von der Leyen said, okay, we are going to suspend the tariffs that are related to this Boeing Airbus case, and we're going to give ourselves four months to resolve this issue. And so I think that's the beginning of the EU and the US sort of smoking the peace pipe and saying, let's resolve the disputes we have so that we can move out together in the World Trade Organization. But let's see. Right. And, and Karen, I'm so happy you mentioned um, the president's outreach to the middle class on, and, and the way that the, the president and the whole foreign policy team are trying to tie foreign policy to the well-being of the American middle class. And, and it's something that I, I don't think I don't think any of us who were career diplomats have really done a particularly good job of it in the past. But it is it, it you know, it, many of us took note of the fact that the first visit that President Biden made to a, a U.S. agency after he was sworn in was to the State Department, where he delivered that message, not only his diplomacy back, but it's in it's in the interests of the American middle class and building that prosperity that we all see that. And I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, the work of GMF and other NGOs in, in trying to show to the American public why it is so important that we're not, we're not doing foreign policy as some sort of uh, charitable sideline. It really is a vital part of our national interests. Yeah, and I think this is something that we have to get a lot better at doing um, because it really struck me over the, the four years of the Trump administration in, in our own little GMF world, you know, we just have taken for granted that Americans believe it is in our interest to have strong allies in Europe. So mm -hmm. we, we don't even really bother explaining- Ipso facto. Right? Like we don't yeah. have to explain why that is. Yeah. And it's certainly reasonable to ask, well, why is that in my interest? That <laughs> we have a strong relationship with Europe and actually, doesn't President Trump have a point that, you know, these Europeans are free riders and they're not paying enough for their defense? These are valuable conversations to have. And I think there are many concrete examples that we can point to, to to say why it puts the U.S. in a better place in the world when it's working with allies. Why is it that we're stronger together? But let's take the pandemic example to start with. Um, you know, what we saw a year ago now, last March, when um, we all became aware of the challenge we were facing with COVID-19, um, the immediate response on both sides of the Atlantic was to really hunker down and protect our national interests. And so in Europe, you saw borders being closed, export bans being put in place on personal protective equipment. You saw the United States hunkering down. Um, and you know, there was a real challenge of vaccine nationalism when we were trying to develop vaccines. Um, there's a desire to bring supply chains back home. So in the United States, mm -hmm. we've been very concerned about relying on China for masks or respirators or pick your item. Um, and all of those reactions to the pandemic are very understandable, but probably the best solution for us as Americans is not just to do everything at home. And maybe we don't want to have a, a supply chain that's dependent on China, but it would probably serve us well to work with our European allies in thinking about how can we together build secure supply chains so that the United States might feel comfortable relying on a France or a Germany or a, a Britain. And I think even though Britain now is outside of the European Union, yeah. We want to be very mindful of engaging the UK in these conversations. Um, so I think our security would be better served if we're working closely with those allies. And we saw, for example, that the first vaccine that was out of the gates was a joint production of a German firm and a US firm, right? It was BioNTech and Pfizer. 
Um, that's a great example of transatlantic cooperation. So, you know, you could think about it in the pandemic space, you can think about it in terms of technology. There was recently a PricewaterhouseCoopers study that said, based on current trends, they defined a, you know, several emerging technologies. And on the majority of those technologies, China is out in front of the United States and also Europe. Europe trails the United States, but China's out ahead of both of us. So, hmm, we hmm. might be well served by cooperating with the Europeans, maybe by um, having sort of joint R&D, or let's say joint pre-competitive R&D on tech development. But I think also in the tech space, it would be really smart for us to pair up with our European allies to think about how can we ensure that we're leading on these emerging technologies, whether it's AI, whether it's robotics, whether it's 5G, whether it's battery development. So I do think that you need to go into the specific issues and really think about what American strengths are, what European strengths are, and how can we, by cooperating, come out in a better place that makes us poised for the kind of global competition that we're facing? Right. May I, may I jump in here? Because there's yeah. one thing about this conversation I've been wondering, and I have you and Jim here to ask, and that's great. Um, as, as important as we know, the transatlantic partnership is, invaluable. And I'm asking this about China. When it receives the attention and focus that it has to, and it does, do we, as a byproduct of that, limit our leverage, especially in regards to China, because of the, the dominance of the transatlantic partnership in comparison to other areas of the globe um, Latin America, Caribbean, Asia, Africa, especially in which China is very active in these areas. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we offset that potential imbalance if there is one, um, and provide us e provide even more leverage for handling global challenges? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I, I would argue that we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. So I'm not saying that, you know, we should have a strong relationship with Europe to the exclusion of other important parts right. of the world. And I actually, I mean, your point about China being very active um, in, I mean, China is very active in its neighborhood in Asia, but to your point, they're also active in Africa, they're active in, in developing countries all around the world, and increasingly they're active in Europe. Right, so, exactly. you know, yeah, what I was talking about exactly. vaccine nationalism, right, China and Russia have been quite successful, actually, in getting pickup on their vaccines. Hungary is a great example, where Hungary is using both Chinese and Russian vaccines, not just European and American vaccines. And on your Africa point, um, I actually think Africa is a place where the U.S. and Europe should be working together. And I think it would be really important for the U.S. and Europe um, to say, and they've said this, I mean, we say we are concerned about equitable distribution of a vaccine for COVID-19. We're not really acting on that. Um, and so I think we should start by really putting our money where our mouths are about equitable distribution of a vaccine. But beyond that, I think there's tremendous growth potential in Africa if the US and Europe were interested in making some investments to really help that growth take off. So, you know, none of this is to suggest we should not be looking at other parts of the world. Um, but I do think there's a real basis for US-European cooperation um, and US cooperation with allies in other parts of the world that can have benefits beyond that relationship. But Jim, you'll have thoughts about this too. So please, you jump in too. No, I, I, I agree with you. And, um, you know, we, we, the way that the United States has um, assisted Africa with um, mostly health crises, when you you know when you think about the the, the PEPFOR program and and all the good that we've done and the goodwill that we've built up, and I I mean I'd add the work that the Obama administration did against Ebola, as another with a lot of European cooperation, 
Um, but, but ultimately, the difference between the West and, and China is our values. And in that, I think we have a much better product to sell to places like Africa. I mean, our story about uh, is about um, not only human rights, but it's, I mean, it's based in rule of law and um, personal freedom and prosperity in ways that, you know, the Chinese have done a wonderful job of building prosperity for, for themselves over the last 30 years. God bless them. That, that's, that's a wonderful thing. But the other stuff they're exporting can't hold a candle, in my opinion, to um, the example that, uh, that the West provides in how we, how we organize our society and how we treat each other. And, um, you know, the Marshall Plan is a great example of the kind of work that we've done. And, and um, there's no reason why we can't continue in that vein in other places in the world. So, Mike Gomez, you wrote this comment, China realizes this to be sure. Can you just explain exactly what you were referring to there? I'm sorry. It was about, you know, China's involvement in Africa, building infrastructure and realizing, and I don't want to pretend to be an expert on this at all, but just the collateral benefits that, that you know, that can, that, that convey. Um, and then, you know, thinking about our own sort of, at least in the last four years, pull inward to sort of this more tiller, uh, and as looking at you know the different way that that just occurred to me that's what i meant i guess i was being kind of snark uh but um but that's what i meant yeah you're i mean no china's being very <laughs> china knows what it's doing and it's being very smart about it i mean one of the interesting things is you also see china i mean it, it, it's filling up those vacuums that have been created um, by essentially U.S. withdrawal, it's not only doing it at the country level, you also see it in multilateral organizations. At the United Nations, it's been fascinating to see China basically try to get every leadership position it can as the U.S. has withdrawn. So China is very clear about what it's doing. The one place where you've seen a real backlash is on some of the Belt and Road Initiative projects, because those are, it's interesting, it's so people compare the Belt and Road Initiative to the Marshall Plan, but a big difference is most Marshall Plan assistance was grant assistance, whereas most of what China is doing through the Belt and Road Initiative are loans. And you've seen some countries become overly indebted through these Belt and Road Initiative projects, and basically they, they cannot repay the debt to China. And that has created a real backlash in some parts of the world. So there's an opportunity there too for the United States and Europe to think about what kind of financing could we offer to some of these developing countries where the terms would be more attractive. I mean, I don't think there's gonna be another Marshall Plan. Um, you know, the Google Marshall Plan, everybody always wants it. And I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I've proposed, oh, we have a new Marshall Plan. But I do think the Marshall Plan was unique to its time. And to Jim's point, I think the Marshall Plan is really the quintessential example of enlightened self-interest, Yes. right? So on the one hand, the United States at the time, it was an act of benevolence. I mean, we did want to help these devastated economies in Europe recover after a tragic war. But on the other hand, we were smart too. And we knew these countries were prospective markets. And we wanted to help them rebuild so that we could have markets. Plus, you had a Soviet Union that was increasingly looking threatening, and these countries were allies. So it was that mix of enlightenment and self-interest that made it such yes. a successful policy. And Great. yeah. Okay. Well, we didn't obviously we didn't want to have to go back and fight another war in Europe. And right. that I mean, it absolutely was a self-interest but not to the exclusion of all the good things that came with it. And, um, and, th and, that, and that, that's what I meant by the Marshall Plan as a model of success. It was enlightened self-interest. Yeah. You know, that's, that's also part of the conversation that I think um, the, the, the administration and, and foreign policy opinion makers needs to have with the American public too, mm -hmm. is just to have a, a, um, more understood that our engagement is really because it's in our interest. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I mean, certainly 
in South Carolina, you know, we um, we export more BMWs than from anywhere else in the world, and a plurality of them go more of them go to China than any other country. Yeah. Interestingly enough, so you know, it's it you 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 can't wall any of these things off. Well, and that point about investment is really important too, because we talked about trade and, and the trade relationship between the US and Europe is important, but the investment relationship is even more important. I mean, if you look at the level of European investment in the United States, which basically means jobs that European companies are creating in the United States, it's very important to the health of our economy. And South Carolina is a great example. I mean, BMW being the most prominent example of that, but there are lots of European yeah. companies based in South Carolina that are employing us Americans. And, yeah. you know, I, I, so there are lots of facets of the relationship that it's important for us to remember, um, for sure. I, th I think the, 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 the chat, there, there are some questions in the chat here. Um, yeah, and everyone, please, uh, particularly the students, we'd love to hear from you. So just jump in, turn on your camera and jump in with a question. But, well, that, Max is going to ask a question, but I don't want to forget to ask you about the German election. Oh. Rather a narrow interest, but it's an important one. And, uh, you know, now, now that the leader... It like a narrow interest, but Jim and I are going to convince you, you too should care. Well, you know, when, the, when the leader of the free world decides to step down after 16 years of service to uh, humanity, it's important. Yeah, so, okay, I get it that normally if someone were to say the two words German election, you would probably yawn and say how boring. But to Jim's point, um, actually, this is a pretty interesting election year in Germany. We all know Angela Merkel because she's in her 16th year of power. I mean, it's crazy, right? She's, she's at the end of her fourth term in office. And the fact that she's been chancellor for so long could lead us to think that Germany is stable, right? Because they've had the same leader and what's interesting about that. But I would argue that, that her longevity as chancellor actually has masked really important domestic political changes in Germany. And those chickens are gonna come home to roost this September. Um, so, we have a series of state elections happening in Germany this year that are going to give us little temperature checks on German politics. Um, but I think there's a lot to suggest that it could be quite difficult to form a government come September. Um, the polls today suggest that Merkel's center-right coalition um, would form a government with the Greens. And we've never seen that kind of a coalition at the national level. Mm -hmm. So that could be kind of exciting because for the first time you have the center right and the Greens in coalition at national level. The Greens have been in government once before, but with the center left party. Um, but it could well be that that support we're seeing from Merkel's party is a bubble. And actually there was just a little bit of a scandal about two parliamentarians from Merkel's um, center right group who made a profit on selling masks at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's been a disgrace for the party. And a lot of people think it's gonna hurt the party's chances in the state elections that are coming up. Um, and this could be the beginning of a drop in support for her party. Um, people also think that that support for the Greens may be a little bit of a bubble. So when you come to September, you could have German voters voting across the number the growing number of parties you have in Germany making it very difficult to form that coalition government and of course how Germany's governed matters because it's the largest economy in the European Union um, and it carries a lot of weight on the European continent and if it takes a long time to form a German government the next thing you know it's going to be the spring of 2022 and you're going to have elections in France and mm -hmm. guess who Macron's big competitor is it's Marine Le Pen, mm -hmm. a far-right politician. And so, you know, there's a concern that the electoral calendars 
could make it quite difficult for the US actually to get big stuff done with its European allies, because we might be bumping into governments that aren't able to act. So I do think it is interesting to watch what's happening in Germany and what comes out of that election. So I'll, I'll stop with that, unless you prod me more, Jim. <laughs> no, it's... Oh, gosh, there are all kinds of questions now. And there is if you can decide which direction we go in. Yeah, there's a guest question and there is a student question. Why don't I take, uh, we take the student question first and then we'll back up. Hey, Christine, um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Christina, there you are. Good. So I put it in the chat, but I was just wondering, I would love to get, this is a very off topic question, but I would love to get your perspective on it and also the perspective of the German Marshall Fund. So I've been keeping up with, um, Russian politics, especially what's been going on with Alexei Navalny and um, the sentence that they um, gave him, which was I think two and a half years and then the subsequent protests that happened. So I just wanted to see what you thought of Germany's economic relationship with Russia concerning Nord Stream 2 and how the new and recent US EU sanctions have affected it or how they will affect the economic relationship with Russia. Well, thanks, Christine. And that's actually not off topic at all. <laughs> that's very much on topic. And, you know, let's start with Germany's relationship with Russia. Um, Germany, really, since the end of World War II, has tried to, on the one hand, while they have a uh, cooperative relationship with Russia, at the same time that the then Soviet Union posed a big threat to West Germany. So there have always been these two elements of Germany's policy toward Russia or the, then the Soviet Union. Um, and you know, we'll all remember that Willy Brandt is known for Ostpolitik, right? He was the first West German chancellor to really try to build out that cooperative relationship with the Soviet Union. And initially it was very contentious in the relationship with the United States, but ultimately the United States was also supportive of that policy of Ostpolitik. And I, I remind us of that history because I do think it's relevant for how Germany sees Nord Stream 2 and actually how Germany sees China. Um, I mean, I think a big part of why Merkel so much wanted to conclude that investment agreement with China in late December was because every other aspect of the relationship with China had become competitive, had become difficult. And this was the last possible way to have something cooperative. And when Germany's thought about its relationship with Russia, one place it's tried to keep cooperation has been on energy. So I mean, for a very long time, Russia has been a major provider of energy to Germany. I think about 30% of Germany's oil and gas comes from Russia. So the German argument is this doesn't make us vulnerable because Russia is as dependent on Western currency as we are on these energy supplies. And this has worked out. It worked out during the Cold War. It's going to work out now. Not a problem. OK, so the Germans feel that Nord Stream 2 should be none of our American business. Like this is a business transaction. They've got it. Thank you for your opinion. Noted, we're not, we're, you know, we're not interested. We don't share your view. The United States, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration have all opposed Nord Stream 2. So there's a concern about energy security. There's a concern about Ukraine because Nord Stream 2 essentially circumvents Ukraine. So the transit fees that Ukraine gets from pipelines that transit its territories it will not benefit from any transit fees if Nord Stream 2 goes into um, usage. Um, so there, there are various issues the United States has with Nord Stream 2. It's been a very contentious issue. At this point, all of Nord Stream 2, except maybe a hundred meters or something has been built. Um, the US Congress is very upset about Nord Stream 2. There is a bipartisan consensus in Congress that Nord Stream 2 should not be built. Legislation has been passed uh, calling for sanctions against companies that are involved in Nord Stream 2. Um, the State Department last month, uh, because of that legislation, 
chose not to sanction German companies, but there are Russian com companies that are sanctioned. Um, and many people understood that to be the State Department sending a signal to Germany that, look, the Biden administration wants to resolve this issue. It is concerned about Nord Stream 2. We can't just wish it away. We can't not address this. You know, German diplomats and American diplomats need to sit at a table and figure out what the compromise here is. You know, Germany, you're telling us you care about Ukraine as much as we do. You say you're as concerned about European energy security as we are. So what does that mean? Can we actually come to an agreement about the underlying issues here so that both sides feel that their equities are being uh, respected? And look, I don't, not in government, I mean, Jim may be better informed on this than I am. No. I don't know, you know, how this is gonna be resolved, but I think it has to be resolved. I mean, I don't think it can just be that Germany continues on its merry way and the United States, you know, continues to sanction. I don't think that's gonna end it's, in a positive place, but- It's also, it there's also, I mean, it's also a, a, a discussion that other European countries very much participate in because I can tell you from the, the Baltic perspective, wh where I was serving most recently, they're adamantly opposed, but they don't feel they're in a position to stop um, something that their most important European ally is championing. Yeah, and this is, I mean, there were many European countries that actually had to approve Nord Stream 2 being built um, because the pipeline was crossing like their territorial waters. And, you know, it, this is one of those cases where I think a lot of people were looking to the United States to be the heavy, <laughs> which seems mm -hmm. a little bit unfair. I mean, it, it, I think it, you know, we we have we hear from a lot of European countries that they don't support Nord Stream two either, um, but I'm not sure they've really been carrying the water with us um, in in concrete terms on this. Um, but Jim is absolutely right that the Baltics, the Poles, many EU member states have been vocal in their opposition to Nord Stream two, and you know. It seems to me that whatever the economic benefits of Nord Stream 2 for Germany, the political fallout of this is disastrous for Germany um, because it has been a major thorn in the side of its relationship with the United States and with many of its European partners uh, for many years now. So it seems to me it's in the German interest to also figure out, okay, how do we resolve this problem? But um, I do think it's a big problem. And I think we got to solve it. And this is why diplomats like Jim get paid the big bucks because they got to come up <laughs> with anymore. a solution <laughs> about how do we fix this? And yeah. look, it's not uncommon for allies to disagree. Like we can talk right. about, like, I remember the Iraq war. <laughs> I can think of lots of examples where there were deep differences between the US and Europe. And you know what you do? You sit down and you figure it out. You negotiate something that works for both sides. And I think we just got to do that with Nord Stream 2. It's a serious problem. We can't wish it away. Mm -hmm. So Christy, maybe you could come up with a good solution. We need creative thinking here. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Well, there is a question on the chat, Jim, from Alex. Great to have you here tonight, Alex. Um, would you like your question read or you want to jump in there and ask it? I'd like to. Oh, Alex, jump in and ask it. Jump in and ask it, Alex. All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be part of this conversation. Uh, my, my question is, uh, uh, to, uh, part observation, part question, and that is <clears throat> that in the 90s, um, the US led NATO uh, in ending the genocide in Bosnia and then later preventing it in Kosovo. Uh, and all of this took place while Europe stood by and watched as their back door was you know, tearing each other apart. Um, in the last eight, you know, six to eight years, I would say the Chinese, the Russians, the Ukrainians, I mean, not Ukrainians, the Turkish and the Iranians and so on have been uh, 
competing for influence in the West Balkans region because it's doorstep to Europe mm -hmm. uh, and a strategic place in, in a lot of important ways. And in the last four years, especially, the U.S. has had much less involvement in that region, creating a, a vacuum for these powers to take even more uh, control and influence in the region. And that has become even more apparent you know, during this pandemic, where these Balkan countries, West Balkans, are looking to China and Russia primarily for uh, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, or the PPE equipment, and so on. Um, I wonder what thoughts, observations you have regarding how you envision the U.S. role in the region going forward, especially under the Biden administration. And, and Biden at that time was, well, in the, uh, uh, he led strong uh, ally coalition involvement in Kosovo in particular. Uh, at that time, he was also vice president, so uh, senator and then later vice president. So. He had a strong role in that region. So I wonder, now he's president, how do you observe that the U.S. role in the region is going to uh, be different compared to the previous four or five years um, as it relates to the U.S. Uh, vying for more leadership role and, and competing with, with the Chinese and the Russian involvement in the region? Yeah. Um... So I, I, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an abbreviated answer, Alex, but I think that the observation you made, which is that the United States, um, after the, the wars in the Balkans, did over time pay less attention to what was happening in the region. And I think there was a, um, an expectation, a hope, I'm not sure what the right noun is, that the European Union would really step in and, and, and engage in a very deep way with the countries of the Western Balkans. We saw, of course, NATO expansion to include some of those countries. Um, Croatia, of course, is in the European Union, but Serbia is the big kid, of course, on the Western Balkans block. And I think it's really critical that um, we be thoughtful about Serbia's future and, and be engaged in the region. Um, and we did see the Trump administration at the end become involved in Serbia, Kosovo, and we can debate whether that was helpful or not helpful, but there was some attention paid to that um, at the end of the Trump administration. And I think it's really important that the Western Balkans not be forgotten. <laughs> um, and certainly the Chinese and the Russians are not forgetting the Western Balkans. And you're absolutely right, Alex, that they have been eager to fill the vacuum. Um, and that's both economically, we've seen it during the pandemic, um, now with vaccines, earlier with PPE. And I was quite struck in reading, you know, the White House always issues a readout of a conversation when the president engages with foreign leaders. And if you look at the readout of his conversation with the European Commission president, the last thing is, and they also discussed, and the Western Balkans was mentioned in that final sentence of the readout. And I took note of that because I think it's important. And I think that the United States needs to be also encouraging the European Union to engage deeply in that region. And Germany plays an important role in the Western Balkans too. So um, I, you know, I think it's easy to overlook some of these uh, parts of Europe, parts of the world, but democracy is not, uh, the roots of democracy are not deep enough yet in the Western Balkans for us to simply turn our attention away. So it's great you're interested. And I think also the Biden administration will engage in that region based on the things we've seen to date. I, I know we are out of time, but I, I really want to ask a question about civil society and the specific work that civil society organizations make and the kind of difference that they make. And uh, I, you know, because we, I, I talk about civil society in my classes and uh, the importance that uh, civil society has on uh, democracy and developing certain skills. Can you talk about the examples of civil society? Uh, that civil society organizations make, uh, the kind of difference that they make in uh, people's lives, in uh, countries' lives, and what kind of work 
the German Marshall Fund does to help and assist these organizations? Sure. I mean, I'm not going to pass up that opportunity. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I think civil society sometimes can be an alienating term. I mean, what do we mean by civil society? We mean us. <laughs> we mean citizens. Um, and I think in the United States, sometimes we can take for granted that we organize around things we care about right, that that's um, a very normal thing to do, right? You have an advisory neighborhood commission, maybe in the neighborhood you live in. And if you're worried about a dangerous intersection, you come together as a collective and raise that concern with the city government. Um, and, and we don't always realize that in countries, and, and this is true for the countries GMF works with, countries that are coming out of a communist past, there isn't a recent tradition of citizens organizing on issues they're concerned about to try to put pressure on the government to change their behavior. And there are lots of examples of issues that we work on in the Balkans and the Black Sea region. Let's take corruption. So let's say that you have a corrupt city government or you have a corrupt uh, department in that government. And, and you feel this, and then you know of 10 other people who also have had that same experience of maybe being extorted when they go to get the permit they need or whatever the specific case may be of that corruption. So then you mobilize and you, as a collective, have the ability to a much greater extent to try to influence what's happening in that department in the city government. So for GMF, it doesn't really matter what the issue is that those civil society groups are organizing around. It could be corruption, it could be women's rights, it could be um, inequitable distribution of, of a COVID vaccine, it could be any particular issue, but it's trying to give support to those community organizations. Um, and it's a very people intensive uh, process because my colleagues who are on the ground obviously are working very closely with those civil society organizations because you need to understand what they're doing and um, what kind of activities they're engaged in. And I think that's really rewarding for my colleagues because when you see those civil society organizations having an impact on the lives of people in that community, it's really rewarding. Um, so that's the kind of work we're doing in, in those parts of Europe. And I think, you know, maybe the thing that's sobering is to see democratic backsliding in other places, right? So um, some of you will be familiar with the Freedom House study. Freedom House just came out with its most recent annual study and it's really disturbing to see democratic backsliding around the world, but certainly in the transatlantic space as well. So I think that this focus on the health of our democracy is very important when we talk about the US-European relationship. And you know, I as an American feel that the point about America's experience with democracy is not that we're perfect, right? We've seen that the United States is not perfect and that our democracy needs to be strengthened as well. But that to me should be something that unites us with Europe because whether we're talking about Marine Le Pen in France or the AFD in Germany or the Sweden Democrats in Sweden or what's happening in Hungary or Poland, I mean, in every European country, you have seen the rise of nationalist populism. So this is a shared challenge. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that wide swaths of our citizens feel ill-served by the governments that we have in place? And so I think that it can be a shared ambition to think about how do we strengthen our democracy? And to come back to the earlier point we made about a foreign policy, for the middle class. That extends to all of us who focus on foreign and security policy as well. We're not exempt from that. We are part of wanting to see a stronger democracy in our own country and have that be the basis of which we are engaging with others through our foreign policy. So let me stop with that and uh, just say, right. what it, yeah. I really appreciate the answer. Yeah, Max, could we 
I know it's it's late, but Jack has waited, uh, Mr. Watson's waited a really long time to ask a question. And can we just tack on one and and get to it as um, pointedly as we can? I know Karen can do that. Jack, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, my question was, how do you think like the legacy of colonialism and imperialism in Africa is going to affect the future of involvement with um, Europe and versus China? I know that Ambassador Melville was talking about like the how Europe brings like democracy and other values, but I feel like the legacy of everything they've done might hurt. So I want to get your take on that. Yeah, well, you know, history is complicated for many European countries in Africa. And, you know, a case in point, we could take France. And it's been interesting to watch Macron struggle with this. Um, you could look at what's happening in the Sahel, where France has been very engaged in combating terrorism. And on the one hand, supporting governments in North Africa. And actually the United States has been very engaged with France in that fight against Boko Haram and others. Um, but there's no question that France's colonial past in those countries makes this a very complicated dynamic. And we're now seeing Macron sort of question France's military engagement against terrorism because it's turning into a long war for France. And I think Macron isn't sure how much progress they're making, but these complicated relationships in the region also make it very difficult for France just to leave. Um, so I, I think there's no question that the present is affected by these past relationships. And we've seen a country like Belgium still, when all of these countries are still coming to terms with that colonial legacy. Uh, we saw Belgium recently kind of revisit the way it is presenting that past in its museums in Belgium. So even the narrative around that history is still very live and unsettled. So I think, you know, that past is very present and continues to be challenging for these European countries. Um, now, you know, whether that gives China more of an opportunity for inroads, you know, I, I think many of these countries in Africa are needing to look to countries that can give them an econo give them economic assistance. And so it's a, I think a pretty straightforward calculation in many cases for these countries. So I think that you know, whether it's Europe or whether it's the United States, when we engage with countries in Africa, we have to be, we need to have their best interests at heart as well, and really try to be thoughtful about what is the way to spark growth in some of these countries in Africa. And there are lots of creative ideas about how you do that. Those countries in Africa are also going to be an important part of the climate equation. So there are lots of issues that could be positive issues for a European agenda with Africa. Um, but you're absolutely right that that backdrop of the colonial past continues to weigh heavily on those relationships. I, I wish we could go on for another hour, such a such an interesting and important discussion. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we, our time is up. And I really want to thank Dr. Donford for a great conversation. And uh, many thanks to Ambassador Melville for directing and, and moderating, guiding this discussion. I also want everyone for you know, tuning uh, uh, to this discussion, to this talk today, for attending this talk. And please join us for future events. On April 7, we will host uh, Lisa Cardi, the director of the U.S. Liaison Office of the United Nations AIDS Fund. She'll talk about international health and humanitarian concerns. And uh, I really appreciate you coming. Thank you, and good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for your talk. Very nice. Alex, great to have you here tonight. Um, if you haven't, if, friends, if you haven't met Alex, he's the director of the Center of International Studies at um, 
upstate, USC upstate. So it's really great, great to have you here, Alex. Great. Hey, thanks for having me here. Max, good to see you here. Uh, good to see you. I, I, I look forward to our meeting. And uh, let me just quickly mention, uh, Timothy, if you, if, you, if you don't mind. Um, Go right ahead. <laughs> I was at UC Upstate last oh, August. I, I see. Uh, last August, they um, decided to take a break from uh, international studies. It was forced on oh. by COVID and, uh, and you know, no travel and budget crisis. So mm. they uh, suspended international programs for a period of time. Not sure yet whether it'll be resumed in the coming year or or 2022 or whatever. So I just want to make a quick uh, yes. adjustment so that uh, folks don't look for me over there. Well, that that's a mistake on their part. I hope they go back and fix it. I think they they will in time, uh, but the current